what we are doing now in the online course world is we have the Discord channel and uh, we have four weeks of meetings. We've had the first week of already. The next week is going to be early July, I think, or mid-July after the Euros. So what we do is we discuss certain topics and then we go away and have two months of homework where we really learn to understand those topics uh, by practicing and providing our own feedback, combining our feedback, having meetings and discussing what we've found. So it's not just reading a book, watching a video, it's interactive. Us as a group, we work together, get through everything. I answer questions, we discuss topics, then we actually do it in the real world. And uh, that way I think that we can all learn to adjust our cars better, understand our cars better, and have better results on the track, and more fun at the track, because our cars are working how we want them to work. I will, from time to time, share videos on YouTube, so you get an idea of what's happening, and then if you really want to be a part of it, then you can join invisiblespeed.net, always open and available. Okay, so where do we start? Last time we talked about the basic theories we need to know. So we talked about load transfer, how we would prefer if all four tires were equally loaded to the right amount, but that's never the case because as you drive around the track, load is always transferring off some tires onto other tires. Then the amount the car can roll and pitch front to back, that's determined by the anti-roll bars, springs, shock position, shock oil, the movement of the car. And then we have this term called the working range. So the amount of movement that is acceptable within which the car still performs well. And then if you push the car too far, it goes outside of that working range, rolls too far, squats too far, and then you're losing time or even worse you lose a lot of time and you spin out or make a bigger mistake so now when we think about these different setups we try to think uh, think how they affect these basic things so load transfer and the working range then we also introduced the concept of initial grip versus overall grip Initial grip means that load transfers quickly. It means that whatever changes occur happen fast. There's a high peak of maximum traction. And then after that, if you aren't careful, you lose that traction very quickly. So that can mean that you spin out or um, you go offline, you make a mistake. So a car with a lot of initial grip and response is very fast but it's harder to drive then the opposite case where you have less initial grip I call that more overall grip the maximum amount of traction is lower but it's more broad so if you push the car a bit too far it doesn't punish you as much that grip level doesn't suddenly drop away it's more gradual so you as a driver have time to notice that Oh, I'm pushing the car too far, sliding a bit, I have to correct. You have more time as a driver to react to what's happening. So that, that kind of car is uh, easier to drive. Okay, so let's tackle ride height first, because that's kind of where everything starts. You should always try to be consistent, so measure it the same way. Some people drop their car on the table, some people push it down. Uh, some people measure the ride height from the very front. Um, front of the chassis right behind where the kickup starts the rear at the very rear some people measure the rear in front of the rear arm you know so there are different locations to measure the ride height and you just have to be consistent measure it the same way same place and know what you are doing so you can't always compare ride heights that other people post for example, Ronne Falk, he, he always pushes his car down, then let's go, 
and measures. So the car will be a bit lower than for me. I just drop it on the table. Uh, the reason it stays lower is because as you push the car down, the tires also move a bit inwards. So they move in and then they, they, the springs don't have enough force to move them back out. So the car stays a bit lower. If you just drop the car, they don't move as far in. So the car stays a bit higher. So there's about a one mil difference. If he says he's running 25, 26, if I measured that same car, I would measure 26, 27. It's just something to keep in mind. So figure out where to measure uh, your ride height. Always do it the same way. Know your own numbers. Okay, so mostly we tend to adjust our ride height so the front is a bit lower than the rear. That's quite standard on just about every car. On the track, it's sort of more level actually than uh, when you're driving. But standard ride height, front two to three millimeters lower than the rear. That's pretty normal. These days, I think the most common range is 25 to 27 front, 27 or 26 to 29 rear. That's the range that most drivers are at. Uh, cars are designed to work at a certain ride height. So making very big changes doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, if you make very big changes, a lot of other things on the car change. So it's not really advisable. So just sort of one to three millimeters change in ride height is plenty already. Um, the only time I really change my ride height is for traction levels. So if I'm on a very high grip track, with, with more droop, what we are doing is we are basically increasing our working range because droop not only affects how high you can lift the car up, it also affects the car in roll, right? So when the car rolls, the inside arm is in droop, right? If you had no droop at all, the car couldn't roll. So as you add more droop, the car can roll further and further, right? Not only lift up further and further. So with more droop, the car can uh, pitch and squat and roll more without causing a sudden load transfer. Because if you remember from yesterday, su suspension movement helps to delay load transfer. So if you have very little droop, the car wants to roll, it rolls as far as it can, droop limits it, load transfers fast. So if you have a small amount of droop, you can drive into a corner, and very quickly reach the limit of your car's working range, right? If you hit that limit, load transfers quickly, maybe you spin out. Maybe if in the rear you don't have enough droop, mid corner you could oversteer, lose the rear end. If you don't have enough droop on the front, uh, what can happen is that the car gets very aggressive and nervous and uh, hard to drive because of that, because there are bumps on the track, there's, there's situations where the front is rolling and it's hitting the limit of the working range of the car, right? And then something happens, a load transfers quickly and it, the car starts to dart off, offline. So more droop, larger working range, an easier car to drive. Uh, so unlike ride height, I think with droop, it's very clear that the, the fastest car will be the one uh, with uh, less droop, right? So everything within reason, of course. But if we say that we, we run a medium amount of droop or a lot of droop, then the one with medium amount will naturally be faster. So droop is a setting where if you think about that spreadsheet that I made, 
we have fast and easy. Then fast is less droop, easy is more droop. So the way to set it really is to start with a lot and then start reducing droop until you see a negative uh, side effect. And that side effect will be Measuring droop, that's kind of important. Let's see, I think I had some uh, pictures here. Because the way most people measure droop is they measure the length of the shock. But the length of the shock is actually an irrelevant measurement because it doesn't tell you how much droop you have. It just tells you how long your shock is. And <laughs> your shock could be any length and your droop could be whatever you can have different shock positions have the exact same droop with a different shock length right so it's only the length of the shock is only valid for yourself to know if you know that with these shock positions 119 millimeter shock is the droop i like if you know that then you can measure the shock and then you can okay i want a bit more you go 120 so on shock length, the difference, the adjustment you make is like from half a millimeter to, to maybe two millimeters. That's sort of the range of a change you make. Uh, but you have to know where the droop is right. You can't compare between different cars. You can't compare even on the same car if you're running a different uh, axle height or different shock position. So measuring the shock is really not a very good way to measure droop. Here is an example. Lift it up, measure that distance. 55 to 75 I put as a range, but mostly, uh, like I said, 57 to 70 in the rear. If basically, if any track, any condition, if you have 65 on the front, 65 on the rear, you know that the droop isn't an issue at least. It will be good. 65, 65, always works. And then you can work from there to try to find the balance of what you want. When you get the setting just right, and it's just at the natural limit of you driving the car around the track, the car moving a certain amount, and when the droop is right there, it helps to set the car in corners. So it doesn't roll further, it doesn't do anything different, it's set. And you have more corner speed, it's easier to maintain your corner speed through fast sweepers, for example. It limits the working range to the perfect amount, let's put it that way. That's the best way I, I can uh, describe it. When, when you have a lot of droop, there, there is no limit. Sometimes you nail a section, sometimes you push the car a bit too far, lose a bit of time. It's easy but it's not quite as efficient, quite as fast. Then when you limit it to just the right amount and you drive the car well, you can do consistently faster laps with the right droop setting. If you have a lot of camber, just a small part of the tire is touching the ground. Zero camber, tire vertical, the biggest possible uh, surface area is touching the ground. So it affects the contact patch, also location of it, but let's not get into that. So a vertical tire, zero camber, should have the most amount of grip available. Uh, when we drive around the track because of our suspension, camber changes, we can't have it vertical at all time, but we adjust the car in certain ways so we have some camber gain as the suspension moves it changes the camber so as the car rolls in the corner it stays relatively close to vertical on the front our caster and all, all our steering angles affect our camber also and uh, it's always present like camber affects every phase of you driving around a track and a, and a car that's well designed it will have the tires at 
sort of good camber angles for most of the lap. Can't always be in that perfect range, but they can be close. So on a good car, when you make a small adjustment to camber, it, it will make a surprisingly big difference also to your lap time because it's affecting your traction throughout the whole track. If you have more static camber, you have less forward uh, drive. But maybe in a corner, your camber with outside tire camber will be perfect and you have more grip in the corner. Or maybe a certain phase when you're accelerating, you have perfect grip. So you have more uh, drive out of corners. And then when you're going straight, it's less critical, you know? So small changes to camber can have a significant effect on uh, your lap time. Even on a car that feels like it's very good. So you think, oh, my car is good. I don't have a problem. Even a very small change to camber. You don't necessarily even feel a change on the car. Your lap time can change. That's why I said that I can guarantee that I can make your car uh, faster or you faster. Because I know that, I mean, not, we aren't serious enough in RC yet to every time we go to the track, find the best camber setting. Like we don't do that. But if we did, and if the top drivers did, the, they could benefit a lot. So if you make a bit bigger change on camber, not just a tiny one, a bigger change, you can notice a significant difference in handling. So you can, you can go from having a car that uh, oversteers. So it's difficult to drive. The front end is aggressive and in the corner you lose the rear end, right? So it's oversteering, front is turning, rear, the rear wants to slide out in some corners. You have to be careful when you are driving around the track. Uh, you can make that car the opposite to where the front will be uh, more neutral and numb and, and the rear will have really good grip. So you can now drive around the track where your car feels calm and stable and you never lose rear traction. Maybe it even pushes a bit in some corners. You can literally make that change only by changing camber. And I don't mean changing camber so much that you can visually see that, that, that you have a lot of camber. Like, I don't mean that. Very often uh, when you see people at the track, they have crazy camber settings. So if, if, this, is, if this is normal, that zero camber, let's say, the tires are like that, like six degrees or something. I don't know. It's completely unnecessary. The range I'm talking is like from half a degree to two and a half, like small, small changes of half a degree or one degree are already significant on the track, especially if you combine it. So for example, you add some camber on the front and you reduce camber on the rear. That really changes the balance of the car. Uh, there are a few different ways to adjust camber or to sort of know where, where you are at with your camber setting. One would be this. This is my favorite. So anyway, um, the reason I cho chose these settings to start off with are because they seem sort of boring and obvious to most people and they aren't, they aren't things that people think to change. Mostly I see when people are at the track, there are two things. Uh, one is that these settings are often overlooked or e exaggerated. So you have a lot of camber or you have a lot of toe out or you maybe even you have a bit of toe in, you know, so they are they are quite far off from the best range of setting. That's one thing. So maybe there are some people in this group who need to take a look at 
their ride height. Okay, that's usually quite correct for everyone, but maybe they droop. Is it really close to 65 if you measure with this ruler setting? Are you close to that? And then your camber, like, do you really have, let's say, half a degree to one degree on the front is very often good. Uh, one to one and a half in the rear is very often good. Is it close to that or do you have five degrees, for example, you know? So some some people need to make sure that they, their settings of these basic things are at least in the range of what's normally good. And then the second thing is, even if they are in that range, most drivers overlook these when they want to adjust their car. They go to a new track or they're at the race and they want to change their car. They don't think that I'm just going to adjust my camber slightly and my toe out a bit and reduce my droop a bit. No, the, it always goes to, I have to change my spring and my piston and my defoil and my everything and different tires. Like you, you go way overboard, right? So that's why I wanted to choose this. We make sure that all of us, we have our settings in the right range. And then we learn to adjust these basic things and we can, we learn to appreciate how much they affect the performance of the car. So when we do our homework, we don't start changing springs and, and uh, pistons and oils and uh, defoils and shock positions and link positions and all these other things that everyone always wants to change. We don't do that. We just adjust with these basic things. Ride height, droop, front toe, camber. Yeah, that's the idea. Minds will be blown. <laughs>